Like most Scots, I first read Robert Burns at school. And over the course of my life as an actor, I've performed his poems many times. But I'm about to embark on a journey to retrace the steps of Robert Burns to find out what made the man and what made the man the genius he was. He is arguably Scotland's most famous son and best-loved poet and songwriter. Each new year, his most famous song is belted out around the world. Rob, with him mere faces than the tune cloak, I'm quite sure. Well, Burns could go only way that suit at Burns. But listen, it just sounds like a good excuse for lots of sex, Davy. Am I right? No. <laughs> I feel so badly for that woman. What is she going to do? He's a dog. Yeah. <laughs> there were only three confirmed pictures of Burns created in his lifetime. His celebrity began before cameras and paparazzi but the artists used their own form of airbrushing to flatter and romanticise Burns. So we've never truly known what he looked like, but this is all going to change. Here in Scotland, we've got the leading forensic facial reconstruction team probably in the world. We had most of his skull. At the end of my journey, I'm going to attend a very special event where thanks to modern science, we are about to find out what Robert Burns really look like. So first stop Ayrshire as I head off in search of Robert Burns. God knows I am no saint. I have a whole host of follies and sins to answer for. But if I could, and I believe I do it as far as I can. I would wipe away all tears from all eyes. Robert Burns wrote those lines in a letter to his friend Peter Hill in Edinburgh. To me, they're the simplest and most profound statement of intent ever written. Burns, with his innate understanding of humanity, knew that we are all glorious and imperfect, and we should never allow our imperfections, our failures, or our inadequacies to stand in the way of our glory. He was saying, go forth and let your goodness shine. So who was this heaven-sent plowman poet? Did he descend from the stars? Did he materialize before the eyes of the good people of Ayrshire? No. So who is he? And what influenced him? And how and why did he manage to write so many pieces of poetry in such a short life? The man was dead at the age of 37. We know that Burns spent the early years of his life on Alloway. And there's an old phrase which says, give me the child until he is seven and I will give you the man. Morabi Burns spent the first seven years of his life in this humble cottage where he was born. You can just imagine him sitting in front of the hearth, the peat burning, his father teaching him English from the Bible, and his mother and his nanny singing him Scottish folk songs, giving him that love of music and dance and the fiddle all his life. Green grow the rushes, oh. Green grow the rushes, oh. oh, oh. The sweetest stories that e'er I spent were spent among the lasses, oh. His father, William Burness, was the child of a tenant farmer, as was his mother, Agnes. Tell me about Rabbi Burns' early life. I mean, when you look around here, it was obviously a fairly basic, it wasn't an affluent existence, was it? No, it wasn't an affluent existence, but at the same time, he wasn't the poorest child in the neighbourhood. I mean, he was part of a family that had real ambitions. William, who was Robert's father, he had started out life as a gardener working for all sorts of um, rich people around the countryside and he wanted to make something better for himself and his family and he went about it in a fairly systematic way. I mean, he built this cottage and set up a market garden in Alloway and then went about working out how best to improve the lot of his children. I mean, he sent Robert to the local school until that closed a few months later and when it did, he got together with neighbours in the village, raised a subscription and hired a teacher, John Murdoch, 
to, to deliver, if you like, a, a community school. And he taught them a good, solid classical education so that by a fairly early age, Burns was able to read and recite French, Latin, good English grammar, historical Scottish texts and so From on. From an early age, almost like teenage years. Oh, before teenage years. Before then. I, I mean, in terms of his reading, um, the, the myth of Burns being some sort of, you know, heaven-taught ploughman is very much belied by the education he had here. If his father gave him a kind of intellectual rigour and a sense of social improvement and the, the ability of humanity to improve itself, his mother gave him the love, the love for humanity, the love of language, the love of music, the ability to connect to people with humour and socially that, that, that stopped him from being a boring demagogue, just spouting out ideas to somebody who was, you know, genuinely lived and breathed humanism and a sense of moral liberation. But he really started to blossom when his dad became a tenant farmer and they moved from the cottage in Alloway to the 90-acre farm of Mount Oliphant. His education didn't just come from books. Like most farmer's sons, he learnt about nature and nurture. But his father pushed him even further. He was sent off to Kirk Oswald to study uh, surveying, effectively. You know, he goes off to study um, how to use chains to measure fields, to draw maps of fields and estates. That's the sort of training you would expect from a tenant farmer in 18th century uh, lowland Scotland. This is the best educated society in, in Europe after Sweden. Very, very high literacy rate. But most people can read. It's much more highly educated than England at the same time. A young rabbi had already got an eye for the lassies and wrote his first poem while still at Mount Oliphant. When he was 18, the family moved up in the world. His father took the tenancy of a bigger farm the 130-acre Lochley at Tarbolton. But it wasn't going to be an easy life for the Bunsies. You drive through Esher now and you see this very green, you know, rather pastoral-looking landscape with hedgerows, green fields, it all looks very lush, and you wonder how on earth would it, might it have been difficult to farm this kind of landscape. Well, it was completely different in, in, in the 1770s and 80s when, when Burns was farming it. For a start, it was an open landscape. It wasn't, there were no enclosures. It was quite bleak. There would be much more moorland the fields haven't been improved, so it's not green. You know, there are patches of rushes around the place. There's a lot of bogs it's, and marshes and mosses. So what you see now is a landscape that's been intensely worked on, you know, for a couple of hundred years. That's a lot of hard manual labour, isn't it? Oh, I mean, it, it, nothing was mechanised in those days. Absolutely, no, no. The thing with farming in the days, too, well, we're at the start of a revolution in farming. Mm -hmm. And Burns come in right at the very start of that. Where you would have one farmer here, there would be four or five families in this farm trying to make a living out of it. Ground run about here, it's that heavy and clay. There was no drainage and uh, great things like that in Burns' day. These things was just coming on. Well, the one thing that always fascinates me about Burns is his great love of the land and of nature. Not just his love for nature, but his love for his animals as well. It was absolutely fantastic, so it was. But we're back to the same thing. He just struggled with the same things the days that we struggle with now. Trying to keep things leaving. Trying to earn something for your family. Trying to better yourself. And nature. Nature, that's the one thing that you just can't predict at all. We hear how his rent was that high and they could hardly pay. Because it'd be full of promises, Davy, so it would. They'd be saying, this is how to farm, this is how much you're going to make. And let me tell you, it's still promises were farming on the day, so it is. Rabbi was going from boy to man and he was starting to mix with people from all walks of life. He comes across as, always to me, as a bit of a chameleon. A man who could change, depending on the social circles he was moving in. Oh, I would right. certainly agree with that. There's no doubt. To mix in these circles, he had to. For here he was at Loch Lee, rubbing his nose in the dirt, and then the next thing, sitting with a laird at the high table. You can't just be all to the left and all to the right. A man's a man for all that. Aye, that'll be right. Burns could go any way that suited Burns. 
through it, a man and it with more than one bombs. face. Absolutely. It would hit two or three like the tune cloak, so he would. <laughs> For a young rabbi, life on the Lochley farm must have been quite lonely. After a couple of years, he and his brother set up a debating club in the village. Burns, when he came to Turbolton, was a relative stranger here. Mm -hmm. But Burns, so well read, so intellectual, Burns came down here and he was regarded as someone a know all. This was a debating club. Oh, they were it's very much like a drinking club and a, and a club for <laughs> hopefully fornication. I think, I think uh, drinking was uh, well down the list of their priorities when they came here. They came here initially to debate. They came prepared. They had pre-selected topics. Now tell me the issues that they debated. What, what, well, what issues were, were important to them? There was one, whether the uneducated native was a happier man than the educated individual. They God, that's really here, the opposite of the popular myth. They came myth. here to debate. Burns, remember, limits this group to 16. I think this is a statement of intent I found in my research, which is smashing. This is about when the club was set up, Every man proper for a member of this society must have a frank, honest, open heart above anything dirty or mean, and must be a professed lover of one or more of, of the, the female, female sex. sex. But listen, it just sounds like a good uh, excuse for lots of sex, Davy, am I right? No. <laughs> <laughs> By the time he was 21, Robert Burns had become a very well-educated young farmer. His appearance was being forged by the physical work and the unforgiving weather. Could he really have looked like this? Stay with us and find out what science says he truly looked like. Seventeen eighty one was to be a momentous year for the twenty two year old Robert Burns. In July he was inducted into the Freemasons Lodge in Tarbolton. The friends and network he made there helped him for the rest of his life. You know, this feels extraordinary. I'm sitting in a in this chair that Robert Burns used. When he was deputy master of the Tarbolton co-winning St. James Freemasonry Lodge, number 135. Oh, you can imagine the power of the man. Here he was, great intellect, great powers of oration. And here he is standing up here, lording it over them all. Extraordinary feeling. This place reeks of history. Yes, of course. You had scholars and intellectuals, philosophers, you had tradesmen, you had craftsmen, all coming to join. Oh yes, it was a broad church in that aspect. I mean, the most high and mighty to the common man, everyone's equal. And that is uh, the way the organisation is founded and based upon. And, and that is the, the thing that makes it almost unique. It was the focal point of the village at that time when Burns came to Turbolton. So it was obvious he would come and join it. He would come here for the companionship. And certainly for the intellectual, it would stimulate his mind and it would give him a vehicle just to express that. People were mesmerised by his voice. Where did that come from, do you think? I, if he was a plowman? An educated plowman, though. Mm -hmm. Don't forget. Mm -hmm. Bundy's poems would be read for the first time in a place like this. He was scribbling 
with the pen at Lochley while he was deputy master here. And he was bringing this stuff down and giving it to his Masonic friends. And he would read it and say, Rabbi, that's good stuff. Somebody else would read it, can I get a copy of that? So you realise Burns would maybe write seven or eight copies of a single poem to hand out. And that's how his fame grew. Burns was a Freemason all his life. As it helped him, he seems to have believed it should help others too. And here we are in 1787. There was absolutely no trust in banks because the year bank had they collapsed. So they used to come to the lodge and get a loan and they had to pay the money back. Now Burns is up in Edinburgh, but he knows that these folk that had a loan for the lodge are due to come before the lodge and he's deputy master, remember. And he can't be and here. He's not going to make it back for the meeting. Right. And here's what he says. The letter, see. Men and brethren, I am truly sorry it is not in my power to be at your quarterly meeting. I suppose those who owe monies by bill or otherwise will appear, and those who confess debt and crave days, I think we should spare them. Oh, fantastic. Oh, wonderful. That's fantastic. He had a real spirited working had... kindness, didn't he? That says you know, more. Big, See that one line that's... that says more about Burns to me than anything else. In 1781, Robert was 22. It was a low point in his life. And he came here to Irvine to live briefly. And you can see why. He obviously came for the balmy tropical weather. Now here he met a seaman, Captain Richard Brown. And Richard Brown planted a seed in Robert's mind. And a few years later, in a letter to his friend, he says, you told me in my repeating some verses to you that you wondered I could resist the temptation of sending such verses to a magazine. It was actually this that gave me an idea of my own pieces which encouraged me to endeavour at the character of a poet. Richard Brown had given Robert the idea of publishing his poetry. John Anderson, my Joe, John Anderson, my Joe. When we were first acquaint Your locks were like the raven Your bonny brow was brent But now your brow is belled, John And your locks are like the snow But blessings on your frosty pal John Anderson, my jewel Back at Lochley his father William became embroiled in a bitter legal battle about the farm tenancy. The stress eventually caused his death in February 1784. The following month, Robert moved his mother, brothers and sisters into a farm a couple of miles away. It was here at Musgill, when Robert was 25, that he became a real farmer. And also, he became the head of the family on his father's early death. But managing a farm the size of Mosgiel was a major undertaking. So Robert and his brothers had to hire farm labourers. Robert even wrote a poem about them called The Inventory. For men, <laughs> have three mischievous boys, run deals for ranting and for noise, a gadsman yin, a thrasher tother, we davock hounds the nout and fodder. I rule them as a och discreetly, and often labour them completely. Now from this we can tell that Burns was not just a tough boss, he was also a fair one. But he was about to find out how tough running a farm this size was going to be. He would need all the help he could get, as over the next couple of years Burns was busy with the lassies and his pen. He met his future wife, Jean Armour, and fathered his first child with a maidservant. As well as getting together over 200 poems for his first book, it was finally published in 1786. Burns had the idea to, to make a, an edition of poetry. He went to John Wilson, the printer in Comarnock, and what they decided to do was to publish by subscription. So this basically meant that he had to contact all of his well-connected friends who would then make sure that certain people subscribed to the Comanic edition. So there was a guaranteed audience there before they made it. So it was kind of like an insurance for the, 
the publisher. While it may have seemed like a risk to John Wilson, it has proved to be the foundation of a nation's love for a young Ayrshire poet. That wouldn't be the Kilmarnock edition, would it? Perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> we don't have just one, we have two Kilmarnock editions here at the museum. They don't look the same. Um, one looks a bit tatty and almost like it's been dunked in water, which it hasn't. Um, and this one's quite beautiful, a nice binding, uh, some gilded pages as well. But they are, in fact, the same. The only difference is, is this is the Kilmarnock edition as it would have come out of the printer's office. Mm -hmm. it has, nothing has been done to it. And you see there's lots of white space here around the edges. Mm -hmm. Now that's because when someone would purchase a book, it would be up to the new owner to have it rebound in the way that they would want it. And of course, they would also have the pages cut to size, to the size of their, their library. Around 600 were printed, and nearly all of them sold out within a few months. People of all walks of life responded to Burns, as is still the case today, I think. So people in his own community, illiterate farmers, heard his poetry and were astounded by it, heard his songs, were astounded by them. And then the most educated people in, in Scotland at the time also responded to him. Even in 1786, critics could help a book to success. Edinburgh's most respected reviewer, Henry Mackenzie, thought the book a triumph. It was Mackenzie's review of the Kilmarnock edition that, that helped make him known to other Edinburgh authors, other Edinburgh philosophers, because that's where he says Robert Burns is the heaven-taught ploughman. A new star was born. The time was right for a celebrity, and Robert Burns certainly had the right qualities and wasn't afraid to show them off. There was an explosion of interest in Burns as a person as well as in his work. Because when he came to Edinburgh, he really stood out as a, as a person because he, he refused to dress in the accepted fashion. He kept his, it was, he wore nice farmer's clothes, but he kept his farmer's clothes. He wore his boots when he walked around town. He wore his boots when he visited these posh drawing rooms carried a riding whip, apparently, at all times, which he used to, to apparently emphasise points in conversation. <laughs> the showman side of Rabbi was happy to play up the ploughman image, but his head does appear to have been turned by the odd status symbol. Um, this is the seal of Robert Burns. He personally designed it. His family didn't have one, but he thought, as a man of standing, that he should. Um, and he actually asked one of his well-to-do friends in Edinburgh how he could get one cut into a highland pebble, I believe he called it. So was that a little bit pretentious? Um, I think he's putting on some airs. I think he's attempting to perhaps match the Edinburgh society that he was meeting um, during his visits. He was marking himself out as different and he was playing to that, that moniker that Henry Mackenzie had given him, the heaven-taught ploughman. He was saying, yes, I am. I'm a ploughman, but I'm also having taught. With the massive success of Burns' work and his brilliant brain for self-promotion came popularity and celebrity. By 1787, artists were flattering Rabi. Alexander Naismith and John Mears had both offered their renditions of Scotland's latest man about town.
with the publication of the Edinburgh edition of his poems chiefly in the Scottish dialect, Robert Burns became the ultimate A-list guest at every party. It gave him more opportunities to use his way with words to charm the opposite sex. I want to show you this because it's really presenting this flowery side um, of Burns's personality. Um, flowery side? Very. Time is too short for ceremony. I swear solemnly in all the tenor of my formed oath to remember you in all the pride and warmth of friendship until I cease to be. Exactly. So That's you can see flowery. he's writing it. She's, she's quite the high society lady, out a bit out of his league, I suppose, a bit out of his reach as well. Um, so I just wanted to show you that before I show you two other letters. Mm -hmm. This letter was written by a woman named May Cameron, and she was a servant girl in Edinburgh. And he got her pregnant. Yes. So basically in this letter, she is saying, I am in dire straits. I've been... Uh, sent away from my job because her pregnancy is showing. Her uh, uh, her employer doesn't want the shame of having a pregnant, a, a married servant. So she's without a job. She has nowhere to go. And she's writing to him to beg for help. God only knows what I am to do, for I dare go near no person that knows me, and I have not got a penny from my own people. Out of quarters, without friends, my situation at present is really deplorable. I beg for God's sake you will write and let me know how I am to do. So she is... She's begging him. Yeah. She wants some help. Um, Does she get it? Well, in a form, yes, but perhaps not in the form that she wanted. Now this is a letter Burns wrote shortly after to his friend Robert Ainsley. Go find the wench and give her 10 or 12 shillings, but don't for heaven's sake meddle with her as a piece. I insist on this on your honor. So he's actually telling him, don't dawdle with her either. <laughs> with her as a piece. Yeah. So basically he says, here, go give her some money and send her out to the country. I mean, this really proves, Amy, I guess, that he's more than a bit of a rogue. How does it make you as a woman feel when you read this? For me... I feel so badly for that woman. She, what is she going to do? I mean, this, this would be the end of the world for her, really, at the moment. So he was having it off with the maids while he was in Edinburgh, yes. as well as... Yes, so while he had his high society to, dinners, he would be... Trying to seduce the elegant, sophisticated <laughs> ladies. He's a dog. Yeah. <laughs> and still well clear of dogs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Burns' rise to fame was truly spectacular. Within a year, he went from being a local farmer here who could write and perform a poem to a nationally recognised poet. Now with this stardom came many requests for his portrait and there were probably two or three painted during his short life which are often confused with the copies that were made later. This has frustrated one Burns fan so much he set off in search of the real face of Robert Burns. Unknowingly, Victorian scientists, while trying to find out why Burns was such a genius, provided the first clue. When Jean Armour died and they, they interred her, they buried her in the Vries next to Rabi, uh, a guy called George Coombe did a, a plaster cast of Burns' skull, and various copies were made of that. Here in Scotland, we've got the leading forensic facial reconstruction team probably in the world. So, I get my thinking uh, Carp Owen and I says, right, I says, why don't we reconstruct Burns and see how he looked in the life? If we'd had all of his skull, then obviously that would have been the, the best possible situation. We had most of his skull mm. and we could estimate the rest of it. We took the laser scan of the skull. So we brought that data back here and basically exported it as a 3D type of digital file into a different piece of computer software. That enables us to do a few things. So the first thing we wanted to do was tidy up. We got rid of any kind of fragments or any artifacts on the, on the digital file, checked the measurements against the original measurements of the skull to make sure it was all life size. I then passed that on to my colleague, Dr. In. He dealt with the kind of lower jaw, which we did not have. So he had to use quite a sophisticated um, formula that they have uh, that was created by an American uh, dental professor um, to, to get the exact proportions of the, the jaw. But if you've got the, the whole of the upper cranium, which we had, you can work out the jaw. 
But what we have with the with the burn skull is this silhouette. Uh huh. So once this is estimated, we can fine tune the facial profile to the silhouette using some average tissue depth data to match it up all the way along. What the silhouette gives us is a profile of the face, but it doesn't tell us much about the position of the eye, the ear, the, the jawline, this kind of anything within the profile. Um, it doesn't really tell us anything about. So it was, uh, it was another good thing to use as a guideline, as were the other portraits and the, the orthodontic patterning. What's great is that we've got a number of different views so we can look at horizontal proportions as well, so you can see where that sits in relation to the shape of the nose, the position of the ear, uh, something that we wouldn't ordinarily get from the bones. Once the model of the head was made, Dr Caroline Erlen decided on the, the, the skin shades and tones, you know, in order mm -hmm. to get the colour right and to get the wig constructed for the head. This isn't a, an artistic impression of Burns or a, a sculpture of Burns where an artist just can he creates their impression of him. This is Burns. This is based in his skull. This is, this is a man as he would have looked in the life. Later in the programme, we'll get to see what the bard really looked like. But so far, I've only looked at one side of his genius. Burns is now known as much for his music as for his poetry. Surprising, really, when his teacher Murdoch describes him as tone deaf, the reality is that he wrote or collected over 300 songs, many of which are sung around the world today. Beauty is within grasp Hear the islands call The last mile is upon us I'll carry you if you fall I know the armor's heavy Where did this musical influence come from? I think that the whole having his mother sing to him, having people in the house perform these songs is absolutely pivotal uh, in Burns' musical education. We know from his sister, talking much later, that he went to song schools, that he, he did other little bits of musical education as a child, but my what, suspicion what, is... What do you mean song schools? Well, my suspicion is that, that a, the little bit of musical education that there was in Burns' young years, I mean, more formal education rather than just listening to songs being sung at home, um, is probably more related to church music and to singing hymns and to singing psalms and to doing those kinds of things. Um, and his tutor, John Murdoch, who worked with him as a young lad, said he didn't have a good ear and he, <laughs> he was torn and he was a, a rubbish voice as well. His own voice might not have been very good, but he obviously admired beauty in more ways than one. The other thing that I always think with Burns is that there's a real connection between women and song. Very often, the people he talks about having heard sing, they're more often women. Uh, he's attracted to them as women, he's usually attracted to them because they're beautiful and, uh, and it just so happens that they sing sweetly, which is the icing on the cake. <laughs> if thou would be my lord, if thou would kiss me lord. Burns' newfound stardom didn't just open bedroom doors. People from all walks of life wanted to meet him, especially music publishers like James Johnson and George Thompson. I think it was the visit to Edinburgh that made the big difference to Burns producing or getting so involved in song culture and that was because in Edinburgh he met James Johnson. He's a, a printer in Edinburgh, he's already started on a big project, a big national song project, the year that Burns arrives in Edinburgh and the collection is to, to pull together uh, I suppose to pull together a kind of body of national songs um, with music so that they can be performed. But it's very much aimed at a literate middle class or growing middle class in Scotland whose daughters are learning the piano. And if you think of those wonderful Jane Austen period films with uh, ladies playing their square pianos, that's exactly the kind of market that Johnson was looking at. But the project is a big cultural, sort of national cultural project. And the city are like diamonds The street lamps, the signs and the cars Though it's bright in this city with our diamonds When they're turning out all of ours Is it correct to say that he made very, very little money? 
Yes, and I think partly that has to do with him feeling that he's making a national contribution. He just refuses payment from them. And in, so out of some kind of sense of national duty? Yeah, I think yeah. he feels that what he's doing is, is too important on a national basis to, to demand any fee for it. And he says in the letter to Thompson that he feels it would be downright sodomy of soul for him to receive payment. Ooh. And Thompson was paying his composers. In fact, Burns made a big mistake, you know, and, and we know how we know how he was at the end of his life. You know, he could have done with a few, you know, pennies to support buying the posh boots that he was so keen to buy. The high principles that stopped Burns taking payment for his songs didn't come into play for all his creative efforts. Now it's pretty obvious that Rabbi Burns had a wonderful way with words and with women. The two most important things in his life. And he probably wrote some of the most beautiful romantic poetry ever written. But there was another side to Burns, a much more body, raunchy, erotic side. There may be a few bleeps in this. I'll tell you the tale of a wife, and she was a wig and a sot. She lived the most sanctified life, while she was fast with her <laughs> Poor woman, she gave to the priest, and told him she made her complaint. There's nothing that troubles my priest, say Sarah and the sins of my and his correspondence, he seemed to enjoy sending these songs around all of his male cronies. And um, he also used to flatter um, patrons and, you know, men of sort of quite distinguished rank by sending the merit versions of these body songs to them, almost as though to say, oh, you know, you're as open-minded as me or you'll enjoy this. And certainly they held great currency among Burns and, con Burns and his contemporaries. What really intrigues me about them, Pauline, is the fact that he, he uses this it's a really raw, animalistic, visceral, uh, like very tangible language that he uses, which is very different from, from his more romantic stuff. Was that influenced by the fact that he was a farmer? Folk culture, which is predominantly sort of sprung from rural areas in Scotland, people did have a healthier, more sort of frank attitude towards sex. And perhaps that's part of it. Perhaps it's because they did have this sort of communication with the physical sort of aspects of life, maybe on a more daily basis than people, you know, in the cities or the, the bourgeois even. And also, I think what comes across is he's got a great appreciation of, of the right of a woman to have her own pleasures. He does try to understand sexuality from the female point of view, both in terms of the enjoyment of it, but also in terms of sympathising with those women who have perhaps been abandoned by their lover with illegitimate children. He does, in some of his body verse, try and sort of communicate the experiences of those women and perhaps invoke sympathy. However, women objectify men in some of Robert Burns' bawdry. Um, you often see sort of female characters. Obviously, they've been written by Burns who have, you know, high expectations of their lovers and he likes to create a joke out of this. And, you know, in some ways, he, he sort of conveys some of male insecurities surrounding sexuality in his body works as well. In the next part, we'll find out why Rabi should have taken payment for both his songs and his bawdry, as well as finding out if the Ayrshire weather would really let one of its farmers look like this.
In 1788, Robert Burns's rise up the social ladder had been so fast, he was able to take on his own farm in Dumfrieshire. He was just 29, married to Jean Armour, and by now the father of at least four children. But his final farming venture was really a case of wrong time, wrong place. Agricultural trade had been badly hit by the American War of Independence and the French Revolution. That, along with the very bad weather, caused massive problems for farmers. After three short years, Robert gave up farming. And who can blame him? He became an exciseman and moved to the town of Dumfries. So would his government salary finally enable him to live in the style which he desired? He had a job that should earn him 90 to 95 pound a year, and he was moving to a nice house in Dumfries with a rent of six pounds, six shillings from Captain Allerton Shaw. Should have been great, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But for one problem, he wrote to Peter Hill, his book at Seller Friends, saying, I have a trouble in life. It's trying to make three guineas do the work of five. <laughs> he obviously enjoyed spending money. As an excise man, a good job. You get a salary, um, you got perks, uh, you got a percentage of all the stuff that was confiscated. You even got a fiver for every pirate you apprehended. So Burns had worked out he should make about 95 to 100 pound a year clear. Burns was actually spending 110 pound a year. So when he went into Dumfries, he was actually his you know, 20, 25, 30 pounds short. What did he spend his money on? A very nice middle class life. Young Robert, his eldest son, looked back and he said that his mum and dad had always kept a very genteel life in Dumfries. They had a maid, they had a mahogany table that they were very proud of, and they had tea every afternoon with their friends. <laughs> very, not quite the radical this rant the, and roll. This was robin. the sign of gentility. That's the sign of gentility. Nice, you'll have had your tea, as they'd say in Edinburgh, but Dumfries Burns was happy to dole it out. Nobody really realised how dangerous his finances were. On his deathbed, he got served a letter by a local, a, a local solicitor. Uh, one of the tailors was dissolving his partnership uh, and was just writing around to everybody saying, I've had enough, I'm going down to Ibiza or wherever Dun uh, Dumfries tailors used to go on holiday in those days. Uh, please, yeah, once you, at the end of the month, if you'd mind, just ping me the money you owe me and we'll call it quits. And that was um, seven pounds and four shillings. Burns had only two pounds in the whole house and he had, had to go in a carriage. On the day of boss, his death. On the day of his death. And he had to go in a carriage you know, to pick that two pound up from his boss, Collector Mitchell, because the money was so tight. So he wrote two letters that, if you read, oh, he did cry from his deathbed. He his final strength to his cousin James up in Montrose and to Thompson over in Edinburgh, who published many, many of his songs, saying, for God's sake, save me from the debtor's prison. And they sent one a tenor and one a fiver but arrived two days after Rab had died. The Caledonian poet laureate was 37 when he died. Over the years, many causes have been given for his death, but the most likely, and the one the medical historians now believe is true, is that he died of heart failure after several bouts of rheumatic fever. I'll leave your schemes alone Adore the rising sun And leave a man alone To his fate, to his fate I leave a man alone To his fate His final resting place was the family mausoleum in St Michael's Kirkyard at Dumfries. But when his wife Jean died in 1834, Victorian scientists took the opportunity to make a cast of Rabbi's skull. This eventually led to the forensic reconstruction of the bard's head. In his short life, only three confirmed pictures were made. It was the time of the Romantics, and Burns had already been called the heaven taught plowman. So it was hardly surprising the pictures, and especially the most famous one, gave him an almost angelic quality. Now, for the first time in over 200 years, we can all see what Robert Burns, farmer and poet, really looked like. If and cares, and then we 
standing here and at one point in his life he stood here as well so it's quite spooky. I used to say about his features or something, like standing uh, you know, features, like the, the eyes sort of thing that grabs you because there's obviously a lot going on behind there. Somebody once said that uh, one Robert Burns was worth a hundred bannock and uh, that's a great phrase. This is the, the real, the real Robert Burns. Think, Ram, are you pleased with the reaction after those it's couple of years of hard work and determination? It's been an absolutely amazing day here, Davey. The, the hubbub and the, the excitement that was in the room and the conversations that were going on and the centre of that attention and conversation was Burns, you know, and uh, you get the feeling that, 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 that Burns' is spirit, you know, that's what he would have wanted. He would have liked to have been the yeah. centre of attention <laughs> in the room and here he was. I feel as though I've been peeling an onion on the short journey through the life of Robert Burns. Each layer revealing a different and often contradictory aspect to this exceptional man. He was charming and charismatic. He had a magnetic personality and his eyes glowed and sparkled when he spoke. He was dangerous. He spoke truth to power. He spoke of love and of peace. He championed justice and equality and a relationship with Mother Nature. He also brought us an understanding of the human condition and a vision of humanity to the affairs of men. Where did this genius come from? I cannot answer that, nor can any of his 200 biographers or any of his millions of fans across the globe. But what I do know is this, we must continue to read and to speak and to perform the works of Robert Burns, not only as an inspiration in our daily lives, but also as an inspiration as we make the changes that shape our future. He gave us a philosophy to create a better world. And it's coming yet for all that, that man to man, the world over, shall brothers be for all that. And then we can begin to wipe all those tears from all those eyes. No rosy may come someday.